was texting with friend of the show, Ben Adamski today. And I mentioned to him, <laughs> Stephen, that you'd be coming on. And he said, that'll be a great show. Anaya is obviously excellent. And Stephen has been quietly one of AMTA's best witnesses for a really long time. How does that compliment from the great one, Ben Adamski, make you feel? It, it feels good. I mean, I'm not going to lie. My first in-person tournament, my, fr- my freshman year was 2021. So the online Zoom season was at BTP. And I sat in that room and I watched Bennett Dembski cross one of Maryland's great witnesses, Abdullah Khan. And I watched a master at work. You know what I mean? Um, but hearing that from Bennett's great. I've run into him in the hallway, different tournaments. I've run into his teams. Um, I think witnesses are often overlooked as far as um, a clout in the community goes. I think witnesses win rounds. I was taught that by, again, Abdullah, who maybe just was boosting his own ego. Uh, but to hear that from Bennett means a lot. I have a lot of respect for the Tufts program, his leadership. And it, it's great, actually. It's a... Uh, like a fever dream. <laughs> you mentioned your your coaching staff, and I think that's one of the other sort of subjects about Maryland's team over the last couple of years that's been uh, discussed a lot. Who are Maryland's coaches? Oh, okay, so we have a kind of a long list. Um, so our coaches for our A team right now are the director of our program, Zach Mundy, and then Liz and Awesome. Then for our B team, it's Abdullah Khan, who uh, was coaching last year and is just graduated. We competed alongside of him. Um, and Stella Asmaram, from, who graduated from Harvard. She was on Harvard's national champion team. Um, and then our C and D teams are coached by a number of alumni from Maryland. Um, Lisa Fish, who just graduated and competed with us. Um, Lauren Gerber, who was a previous alumni of Rahul Hari. Um, and we have a, a number of, or sorry, not Rahul Hari, no Rahul Srinivas. I was going to say, uh, yeah. breaking so news. I, like, I started talking about mock trial, then I immediately went to Rahul Hari, no, no. Uh, Rahul Srinivas, um, who is phenomenal. And we've worked alongside of all these people. And we have a number of people that come in and out um, and are also working. So if I missed a name, I apologize. But um, that's basically who our coaching staff is right now. You mentioned uh, that one of the coaches is the the director. I think that's the title that you said that person has. And who is that person again? Zach Mundy. Um, so also was won our nat- last national champion back in 2008. But he is who who works at the university. So he's like the correspondent between our u- university and the entire program. So he kind of oversees the whole program, essentially. W- what does, does Zach do for the program? Is he more administrative? Does he actually coach? It's been, I mean, he does most of the, or he does like the administrative stuff and then he coaches at times. It, it kind of just depends on what he's doing. <laughs> so he sat in many a tab room as well, you know, checking ballots doing, and I've yeah. seen him at orcs at, at regionals. He's traveled to help the AMTA community in tab rooms. I mean, he's an AMTA rep as far as I know. I don't know if that's changed in the last year, but. Is, yeah. is there someone or some sort of group of people that you would consider the head coaches of the A team? The head coaches of the A team are definitely Liz and Awesome as far as like being on the ground, like really like working with us all the time. Um, they kind of like run most of the stuff and then Zach handles the administrative stuff and then also comes in and handles things too. So what do Liz and, and Awesome do for, for the A team? I'll tell you, it starts with the 110 comments I got on one direct examination last night at about 11 p.m. So I can thank them for that, that heart attack. Um, but it's everything. You know, one of the first things they told us when they came being sort of foreign to us, right? They're not Maryland alumni. We didn't compete alongside them was buy into us and we'll buy into you. You know what I mean? They 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 drive a hard bargain. They really push the wagon uphill. Um, but it's everything from theory to call order to stack and cast to setting deadlines. I mean, they really do drive uh, the ship. Um, they, they motivate us to work hard and they work equally as hard. You know, they were at the uh, the Spanish countryside over over break and they were editing directs and crosses. And so I think they, they run everything and to that same extent, they work just as hard as we do up until the round starts. And I think that also has driven a lot of our success in the last year and hopefully this year is we have really, you know, involved coaches behind us. So it's, it yeah. sounds like the coaching staff at Maryland is pretty heavily involved um, in the, they're pretty hands-on in terms of content, in terms of sort of strategy and theory. Is that a change from the time that 
the two of you entered the program? Is that something that's new over the last couple of years? It's actually not really. Um, I think Liz and Osmar are a little bit more involved in the sense that like they'll often like call with us a little bit more often in that sort of sense. But as far as content production and theory production, it's always been that our general coaching staff decides which theories each team is going to run. And that's all based on discussions with students too. But the, the final decision just comes down to the coaching staff and we're just ready to go gung-ho about whatever they choose. Um, but as far as content, it's always been, we as the competitors write it and then they will leave comments on our Google Docs and then we're in charge of you know editing those. Um, but it's always kind of been that way since we joined on and Liz and Ozum just adapted to it and... Yeah, they're they're fantastic at doing it too. So, and obviously, to the point that you made a second ago, maybe this has been the culture around Maryland for some period of time. But Liz and Osmond's presence on the team is a new thing, even to the extent that they're sort of adopting what was done previously in terms of the expectation that coaches are going to be heavily involved. How has at least their presence with respect to the A team changed the way that Maryland competes? It seems to me as an outside observer who doesn't know much about what's going on behind closed doors, that their presence has made an immense difference in success at the top of your program. Yeah. I mean, I think Maryland has the benefit of what I, I call institutional knowledge, right? You think of the great programs, they have a history of success. They have a history of people coming back and contributing. As we said, we have a whole bunch of alumni coaches and returners who, who come back and, and give their knowledge to the new people in the program. Um, what I think Liz and Osmond bring is technical perfection and the expectation that we are technically perfect. And I think that's a big shift from generally understanding with, as we saw this season, we have unstacked teams winning tournaments, placing tournaments, that's institutional knowledge. Winning the high, high at orcs, that's technical perfection. And that's the expectation they bring to practice, to scrimmages and to rounds that I think has shifted the mentality from, you know, it's not, it's not good enough just to be good. You have to be great. You have to prove it with the details. And I think that's sort of the mentality shift that at least from my perspective, they they really brought to our, pre, our, our program. Yeah, I think they were a really more so supportive force because, I mean, if you look at our fall invitational success, I mean, all of our, we have four fall teams, but Liz and Awesome were only coaches for one of those. So the other fall teams are, are coached by uh, the variety of you know coaches that we have. So it's, it wasn't just one person or two people coming in and changing anything, but I do think at least for having worked with them last year and this year that they do, they're very ambitious people and they've had a lot of success doing this and they bring that, they really believe in you and really push you to do the best that you can. And I think that mentality is actually more important than any piece of like any edit that they've made on one of my, you know, direct examinations or something like that. Can you give me an example of something that Liz or Asim have sort of pushed um, on you guys over the last couple of years that maybe wasn't something that you were doing before that? I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, when Justin Bernstein got to, to Drexel and was my coach, he really uh, impressed upon me the importance of performance, meaning volume and physicality and speed and volume and all that stuff. Um, and so that was a, a really big difference from watching myself as a college competitor or a second year law school competitor to my third year. Uh, is there something like that, that Liz and Ozem have sort of imposed upon your A team and your, and your teammates that has made a difference? Um, I know one thing, this is just for my own personal you know, anecdote. When I first started working with them, I had them as my coaches for the fall of last season. Um, and so Ozem told me something before we got to round and it was make a decision and stick to it. Um, and he was telling me that I'm not going to get mad at you for making a decision in round that you think at the time is the best and maybe it doesn't turn out that well, but I will get mad at you if you choose not to make decisions in the moment and try and uh, react and adapt to things. And I think that really for me personally, who was, I was really trying to work on being more adaptive. I think that kind of support was very helpful for me to ease my anxiety and feel that I can adapt to things without the worry that my coach is going to come up and yell at me and be like, why'd you do that? Like, wh what were you thinking in that moment? And just having that sort of support behind me was something helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from the witness perspective, I mean, I was lucky enough my freshman year to kind of find the niche I fit into, which is, 
you put on the accent, you make the jokes, slapstick humor wins the day. And that's sort of the, the mentality I had for the first two years of competing. Uh, but when Liz and Ozzam came, they really emphasized nuance in my performances. And that's across all witnesses, right? It doesn't matter if you're a party rep or an expert is there's arcs to this. You are a person, not a caricature. And it was, it was difficult at first, but they emphasize, and I think it's something we'll, we'll see later in the footage that we watch, that you're more than a joke, you're more than an accent. And if you're a police officer, an expert, you're more than a master's degree, you're more than a badge. Um, if you're a crime witness, you're more than tears, right? And so adding nuance to our witnesses, I think, made a big difference in us winning close rounds. And that's just the kind of thing that we didn't have before, but they really brought it to the table across the board from the teams they coached. I want to just talk really briefly about trial by combat. Uh, Lanaya, last time you were on the show, we it was a few weeks before the trial by combat play-in tournament, the inaugural play-in tournament, and you advanced to the championship trial of the inaugural play-in and lost a really close, really great trial to, to Ben Wallace. How disappointed were you, if at all, with the result? For There was a, there was time where I was disappointed in the result, but I was also – there was – a tiny bit of relief in the sense that going through that 24 hour period was so incredibly stressful that I was like, well, I guess at least I don't need to do this for a, a few months down the line. Um, I was disappointed, but I also felt that I did the best that I could do with what I knew. And Ben put on a really good performance. I wasn't like, oh, I think this result is rigged. This is terrible or anything like that. Um, I I was happy to really just be included and be involved. Um, so I think I, I wasn't that disappointed as as maybe some more competitive people might be. With that, we're going to watch the first of our two videos. The first is uh, from round four uh, at Cubate between uh, a trial between Emory and your Maryland squad. Um, and we're going to watch specifically, Stephen, your witness performance. So before mm -hmm. we get into this, I'm sure most of our viewers know what the case is about, but specifically with respect to your performance, what are we about to see? Sure. So this is a prosecution of one of the defendants, uh, Berka de la Porta, eccentric billionaire who was, uh, he's been accused of stealing art from a gallery and selling it and, and all that good stuff. Um, my character is a event organizer, a close friend, business partner who saw the robbers in the building, saw the whole thing unfold. And so uh, a lot of what I bring in this surprising turn of events are material facts to the case. I'm quite used to being a character witness who offers funny jokes and an accent has nothing of consequence to say, as a lot of character witnesses are, wit are written. Uh, but in this case, you know, I'm providing uh, character support for the defendant, but also I'm talking about what actually happened the night of, what I saw, what I didn't see. So a unique position to actually have something to say as a character witness. Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the defense calls Cypress Cosmos to the stand. All right, Mr. Cosmos, uh, you may take the stand. We've already been sworn. All right, so who is that guy? There's a couple guys on the screen. Are we talking about uh, me, myself, and I, or Mr. Gabe Rosella, sometimes incorrectly referred to as Mr. Rotini by opposing counsel? The guy who is not you. Who is that guy? Uh, it's Gabe Rosella, a sophomore on our team, came in his freshman year, made quite a storm, you know, moving on to the eight, team, competing at regionals and orcs, opening against Travis Harper. Um, but he's the the you know peanut to my m&m we are a package duo we like to go back and forth on our directs and he's pretty much mostly been my directing attorney the last two years thank you permission to proceed go ahead good evening sir can you introduce yourself to the members of the jury good evening my name is cypress cosmos what do you do for a living mr cosmos Technically, I'm an entrepreneur by trade. In the 80s, my family founded the Clapper, you know. Honest buildings or like that, they still may have had it. But we found the Clapper. After that, my brother and I started the Snapper. But after two businesses, I wanted to settle down. So I married my ex-husband, but he turned out to be a yeah. Maybe we can pause here All for right, a second. Sir, did you grow up? This is probably the only joke that was delivered the same way across all four rounds. Um, anyone on my team can probably attest to the fact you never know what I'm going to say. It doesn't matter what's written down. Um, but we wrote that in the car on the way to the tournament. I was on my phone writing my direct, rewriting it as I typically do. I gave it to one of our teammates, Lucy Feldman, who also happens to be my girlfriend. So, of course, she has something to say. She rewrote that joke, the yap or the snap or the clapper, and it stuck. And I just think that's 
really indicative of sort of how I do witnessing is it's, it's never the same. It always changes. And even leading up to like, when you walk in the room, the joke's not going to be the same. Grow up here in Midlands. I did. Uh, born, I was here with my family, my brother Paulie, but it wasn't easy growing up. We didn't have a lot of money. All this I ever got was five foot 10. And I spent a lot of years living in New Jersey. Sir, after you sold those businesses, what did you do with all that money? I was a full stop, one of the fortunate ones. So I wanted to give back to the community that treated me so well. So now I mostly do philanthropy around town. <clears throat> what does your philanthropic work include? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, but most of my work centers around the local organization, one very close to me called the Sophie Children's Hospital. So what is the inspiration for this character? Where did it come from? I'm a big Sopranos fan. And when I watched this for the first time, I got Tony Soprano uh, vibes. What's the inspiration for the character? Yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. It's a good fella. Um, we competed a lot of tournaments in New York and New Jersey, up and down the East Coast. And as I started to experiment with this particular sort of accent and portrayal, I'm not going to run a, a precisely New York accent because some judge is going to be from the Bronx and he's going to say, that's not how you say, forget about it. And I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, I'm going to be in New Jersey and I'm not going to say see caucus, right. And I'm going to get in trouble. So the idea is to be general enough. You can't pinpoint where things are loose, but specific enough. You can say that's Joe Pesci. That's Tony Soprano. That's Martin's like, whatever you want to say. So I think it's a balance between being a character that people can relate to, whether or not you've seen, Goodfellas, you've seen uh, the Irishman, Casino, whatever it is. But the inspiration is just to be someone who's recognizable from TV or maybe a movie that if they don't like me, they might like the character. And there's some little bit of a help there with with my less than stellar acting. But it's similar enough. They kind of get the gist. Do you do other accents? Yeah. You know, it depends on the character. There was um, a Scottish accent written that wasn't performed that weekend. I've done Southern, Canadian, German, sort of all across the board. Um Abdullah Khan, who you mentioned earlier, sort of had the monopoly on European accents. So for the most part, it's been American, you know, Southern New York, what, what have you. Um, but we're breaking out some new accents for the season, which I'm, of course, excited for. Linaya, uh, obviously, besides this one, I'm sure there are some other ones that he does well. What's your favorite? Um, honestly, the one he the one he's doing in this one is my favorite. <laughs> um, but he also has this. And I think this is just more a little bit of nostalgia. Our first year, he did this Southern accent. Like, that was so, like, foghorn, leghorn type, really Southern draw that I just find to be absolutely hilarious when he does it. Not because he's trying to be funny or anything like that. It's just so funny to hear him do it after having run it that year. So I guess that would be my, my second favorite. It's inspired by um, Detective Blanc from Knives Out, sort of the the whole and donut whole sort of thing. Like it's it's all very dramatic, and that's sort of the idea. Well, can we hear a little bit? I do declare that's a bunch of poppy cock. Now, uh, this particular situation, uh, there's a piece of the puzzle missing, but I don't do puzzles because I always lose the pieces in my glasses here. Uh, they are expired. It's all a bit. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the most exaggerated version of any accent you've ever seen. But it's a distracting enough thing where they won't call me out when I slip or when something goes awry. It's, I think, honestly, the best way to do an accent. But that's maybe just a preference. Is it when I as good as you remember it, or has he has he lost a step? It, that's just about as good as I remember it being. My back may hurt in the morning, but uh, you know, I'm, I still <laughs> got it. This old this old dog still has his tricks. Sir, how did you get involved with the Children's Hospital? Um, my, my brother Paul, who I mentioned earlier, he grew up a very sick kid. I mean, holidays, birthdays, graduation, he missed all of it getting treatment. We lost him right after his 21st birthday. So now I, I work with them to give back the way they gave back to my family. Just going to pause real quick again. Um, um, do you know who you're involved? This is what I mentioned earlier with Liz and Oz and bringing nuance to a character. Um, in this particular case, right, I'm involved with this children's hospital with the, the planners of the event because my brother was sick and he passed away after being cared for by the hospital. Um, last year, playing an airline mechanic, I talked about my wife and how I was a humble guy who just had one suit. 
um, I think that's something, at least in the last two years, I've realized can really distinguish a good from a great character witness. Like Anat Rajan from Harvard does a great job of this as well. Um, you need to add some depth. And I think that's something I just really didn't consider previously, but we try to, you know, tie it in the beginning and bring it through the end. Uh, but it's definitely a, a part of character witness. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily consider is that you can be more than just the accent of the, of the bit. So that's sort of that part in the direct where we introduce that. Um, and I was really glad we did it on this character in particular. Yeah. So I, it's no secret to anyone that watches the show that I'm not a fan of the character witness stuff at all, but this is the kind of character witness that I like, which is you sort of alluded to it, Stephen, a minute ago, which is you need to be like a real person, right? And when I watch you, I sort of um, reminds me of Neil Lacha from Harvard. Um, that's sort of the and he's the kind of character witness that I like. Like, feels like someone that you could actually could actually meet on the street, right? And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is find witnesses that are credible, whether it be because they're really intelligent and they're really passionate about the expert topic that they're testifying about or because they seem like sort of an everyman in how this character is. Um, and so I think this is the kind of character witness that we should be seeing more of that I think is pretty rare in Empton. Do you guys agree with that? Not that I'm asking to, to toot your own horn here, but do you think, do, am I, I right about that? I think I agree because I think I tend, we tend to see, like two, two extremes either someone's going all out i know like we saw not to say that these weren't funny or like but we saw like another a number of witnesses make very sexual jokes during it and sure they were funny but it's also like i feel like a judge would clearly admonish a witness for saying during, anything like that during during like, what it, just during their like direct examination just like just like in funny... like in, in general this season or just like with yeah, a specific no, yeah, witness yeah. No, and this is just, I'm not trying to single any person out. If you think I'm referring to you, I don't think I might because we've seen it a number of times. And we like to play these big kind of boisterous witnesses, but we are keeping in mind that this is court. So we don't want to do anything, especially we don't do, want to do anything that would offend a judge in the moment um, because we're trying to play to all judges. You know, if you like character witnesses, if you don't like character witnesses, we're trying to find something to connect with all of them. Yeah, like this is the kind of witness that I would score high. Whereas, um, you know, someone, I think AMDA witnesses at some point shifted to it sort of being like a stand up comedy contest, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and to the extent that the goal is to make the judges laugh, it sort of incentivizes being outlandish because, mm -hmm. you know, there's only so many times you can tell the same joke. Um, and so my concern with this witness, and I'm sure it's something that's crossed your guys, and I'd be curious actually if it's something you guys talk about, is what if you run into the judge who expects the ridiculous witness and not this kind of character portrayal? Have you have you noticed, Stephen, that maybe you're not scoring as well as those witnesses occasionally? Sure. I mean, it's hit or miss. And I think we try to emphasize, we want to play to the widest judging pool possible. We don't want to play to specific judges, right? You don't know who's going to walk in that room right before the round starts. And there's, there's adjustments that are made, right? If I have a joke about a, a musician and I see two 20, 30 some year old women, I might make a Taylor Swift joke. If I see two guys with hearing aids, I might make an Elvis Presley joke. Um, but that being said, we don't modify our performance to suit one particular person because we can't take that gamble to guess who it's going to be. That being said, we try to find a middle ground. And as I mentioned earlier, like invitationals or reps in the gym, we do travel. We do see a whole bunch of different judging pools and we start to kind of gauge that joke didn't hit, that joke hits no matter who it is. And that joke should have been thrown in a dumpster fire last week. So we do get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. I don't find, I mean, I don't think based on like our ballots or results or any comments that we get that Stephen necessarily compared to those other witnesses does any worse really because he does tell very specific funny jokes that are a little bit out of place for, you know, just playing a realistic character. Um, but at the same time, I think the the weakness that those other witnesses have is that it's really difficult to keep up that character on cross to be the same like loud, jokey person on cross. And I think a lot of those witnesses get dinged down for that because suddenly their character is gone or, or much different versus it's much easier if you're 
half joke, half real to be able to keep that up um, later as the trial goes on. Yeah, that that's the great equalizer is the cross. And I think just before we move on, on cross, I, I will lean into jokes 100% because there's nothing to throw a crossing attorney off as a pre-written cross with other page and line numbers than when I make a joke about throwing a cup in the trash and saying Kobe. I mean, it, it, you, you lean into the jokes, you lean into the bit on cross because no one expects it to happen and it's not scripted. And I think that if you're going to play a character really lead heavy, like 70% on cross is character, 30% is realistic, maybe the other way around if you're on direct, but that's just sort of how we break it down. Involved in today's trial? I know. Um, I worked as the event coordinator for the cherry auction at Miller Tower last Halloween. I was there that night when the robbers broke in, when they stole the art, and so I'm here to talk about what I know. We'll get to all that in a moment, sir. So I didn't ask you, um, and I should have, this is round four, presumably high, high against uh, Emery. So a big round. Uh, what did you guys think of Emery? It was fun. It was a great, yeah. great round. We've hit them many times. Um, and I, from, I'll just speak from like a witness perspective, but we were obviously the second side to go defense case in chief. The, the the gas was on, right? They had phenomenal witnessing across the board. They had two characters, one Southern, well, characters is the wrong word. They had an accented witness who played an emotional character that was phenomenal, a Greek character witness that was phenomenal and a great expert. And so as a witness, right, that the bar has been set and it's my job to jump over. They're a phenomenal team and it's always, it, we're sweating in the back of that room. If, at least At least I was. Yeah, we came out of that round and we were like, I don't think we necessarily had this um, um it was really tough they came i think third at q um so very difficult round um yeah and props to them emory's had some turnover over the last couple of years but i think they're going to be just as strong uh this year as they, they've been previously absolutely uh, but first let's talk about the planning for this event sure sure Mr. Cosmos, what was your role in it all? I basically made phone calls. I called caterers, I called decorators, I helped procure items for the auction, just to help wherever I was needed. Did you hold that responsibility by yourself? No. Um, I worked with several other people, uh, seven to be specific, but my co-chair, the person who really helped shoulder the load, uh, was an acquaintance, uh, Miss Berkeley Day was born. Mr. Cosmos, what kind of items did you gather for auction that evening? All kinds of things. There, there were paintings, there was jewelry, ancient artifacts. I tried to give an ancient artifact of my own, my old Blackberry cell phone. But, but they weren't interested in all that. There were also items we couldn't get, as life goes. Uh, so there were some that were on display, uh, but not actually up for sale. Sir, could you describe some of those items on display for us? Sure. There were three specific paintings that were on display, but one for sale. Pardon my French is terrible. They were pronounced Barith Morisot paintings. They were beautiful paintings donated to us, but they weren't for us. I'll just Where I'll pause here. Um, <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> I always try not to like laugh at character witnesses' jokes because I just sometimes feel like it's weird for me to be on the bench laughing. But I think having just being friends with Steven, I, I again, we I don't know what Steven is going to say when he gets up on direct examination. Half the things he says, I've never heard it before. He just came up with it. So he'll like <laughs> say something like Barith more swat. And I'm just like holding up my legal pad. Like I didn't know you were going to say that. And like trying not to laugh at him. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I had Clay Owens and Tamara Joseph on the show a couple of years ago. Crazy to say this. I can't believe this has been going this show has been going on for a couple of years. And um it's my favorite episode of the show. And one of the things that Clay said was very similar, which is that that direct that we watched of tomorrow's at Orcs, she had rewritten right before the round that he had no idea what the jokes were. So all of his laughs in the in the trial are genuine laughs. Also, all the laughs in this direct are very much just real because I don't know the jokes already. So yeah, like, that was my next question. Like I, I did what, show him the direct after I was done with it. When I had when I had watched this, I saw you laughing a bunch, and I was like, "Oh, that's kind of smart. You, you you're like having a playful like whatever with your witness, but like these are real laughs. Like this is not fake." Yeah, I mean, usually I try to like 
keep that like funny demeanor with like a character witness but in this particular direct i didn't have to because i was genuinely just like oh that was really funny i've never heard that you've seen that direct it's it's the one exception to the rule that characters need to be real she may be the only person that can pull that off uh i think she's incredible but i would imagine it's really tough to be watching any good character witness not knowing what's about to happen and keep a straight face Got to be there, there are two there, there are two parts to that. Gabe, my directing attorney, we've had to coach him not to laugh, not because I'm funny, but because he's also a funny guy and he writes a lot of my jokes. And so when he sees me doing his joke, he gets a real kick out of it. Uh, the second thing is that joke actually came from my mumbo jumbo tournament where I attorneyed. I was crossing the FBI agent. And I mispronounced Maury so and she corrected me and I said, pardon my French detective. So so the, the, the inspiration for that joke was something I did as an attorney. And back to your earlier question, why I'm not an attorney is because I treat it like my cousin Vinny. I'm basically a character witness who's asking questions on cross-examination. It, it doesn't necessarily play well in the higher rounds, but the inspiration for that joke was remembering what happened as an attorney. And it, it was a fun one, but when I was right, it wasn't planned. The other thing that, that jumps out to me about watching this direct is I always find it, I don't know what the right word is, that in a sort of not awkward, but maybe a little bit awkward slash uncomfortable when you've got like a big character or any character really in a small room like this, you know, because you feel every, everyone just feels like so close. And when there's not, you know, when if it's, if there's like laughter the whole time, then it's fine. But inevitably, like someone's looking down at their paper and they're not listening closely to that joke, or maybe they just don't think it's funny. Um, and there's not always like knee slapping laughter the whole time. How do you deal with that? Well, it, it's hit or miss. But, but the thing is, I don't know if it's so much in this direct, but I have a, a, a thing where I laugh at my own jokes. It's the Joe Pesci laugh, the, like the kind of nasally breathy laugh. The comedy clubs have low ceilings, dimly lit rooms. Everyone's packed together because laughter, like a yawn, is contagious. The idea is the judges aren't always going to hear what I said. They're not going to think what I said is funny. But if I laugh at my own joke, maybe just maybe in that tiny room with all eyes on me, I can convince someone to play along. So over the last three years, I've used that literally as a tool to encourage people to go on this sort of this sort of crazy journey with me. Like I'm laughing, so it's OK. You can laugh, too. But, but sometimes it sucks. I mean, it's sometimes you're in a room and you're just either bombing because it's not funny or not feeling you, whatever it is. Uh, but you can't let that sort of mentally get in your head. You have to laugh at yourself, laugh at your own jokes, laugh at the ridiculousness of someone from Denver, Colorado, pretending to be uh, John Gotti, who's also like an eccentric billionaire. It's all so absurd. And so you really have to laugh at it and try to invite people to do it along with you. Yeah. I mean, the the thing that I think anyone watching this right now and listening to you talk about it, that is obvious is that while they may agree or disagree with sort of your philosophy, I tend to agree with a lot of what you're saying, that you have a philosophy. You're someone who's, who's obviously thought about this a lot. Um, what do you think is the biggest mistake that people or, or competitors that are trying to do character witnesses like this make? Uh, people, people think it's easy. And I, I say that not to like toot my own horn, but one of our other, my other teammates, Lucy Feldman, who plays our emotional witnesses and our, our party reps was trying to write a character witness for a tryout. And it's like, this is really hard. And it is because it's, it's not hard to do an accent. A lot of people can do a decent Southern accent, a decent New York accent. Um, but if you really want to be good, and you also not only just just be good, but hang in with people like Lanaya Davis and like Rebecca Sher, like Gabe Rosell, like you want to hang in with the people who are also on your team, you have to make it a science. You really have to look at your performance and say, why didn't that work? And so I think a lot of times it gets overlooked as a gimmick, as a bit, and a lot of, a lot of time it is. That's what makes it sort of charming, if you will. Um, but but being a character witness or witness in general is equally as much of a technical exercise as being an attorney. And I think once you shift your mindset to how am I pacing? Where are my hands? How is my accent shifting? Where is my tone? Uh, how am I adapting my jokes to the judges? Like where on cross am I going to hit him with a zinger? Making it that detailed is a huge difference maker between being a six and a seven on direct an eight and a nine and then you know point differentials on cross it really does become a science if you want to be good at it yeah i will say steven's probably one of like he's a very technical 
competitor. I know there are a lot of witnesses that just like, oh, I'll be funny and, you know, not really do the technicals or the analysis behind mock trial. But Stephen really dives deep, probably more, sometimes more so than I do about like my own performance or anything like that. There were two homes. Uh, two of the paintings were owned by Bancroft Estates, and one was owned by Miss Berkeley Dillon. Mr. Cosmos, do you know where those paintings were stored on the night of the heist? Well, during the auction, they was in the cocktail room for all to see. But after the auction, they were moved into a vault down the main hall. Sir, let's move on and talk about that night, October 31st. Sure, sure. Do you remember what time that auction started to wind out? About nine o'clock, about two hours after it started. As things were settling down, I was out in the hallway making phone calls to my mom to let know the job. Were you able to make those calls successfully? No. No, I mean, in the hallway trying to get a better signal looking like Lady Liberty up there. And it's in that hallway. At that moment, I see two people with masks on taking on out of freedom. Sir, were you able to identify either of those two people? One of them had a, what's it called? Baka, 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 a ski, ski mask, not baka, but that's the pastry. A ski mask on his head. The other person had a mask on top of the head wearing it kind of like a hat. Sir, when you saw those two people, what did you do? I noticed you're like very deliberate about the way you use your hands with this character. Is, it, is that a yeah. choice you're making? Of course. I mean, physicality, this is the big transition between being in Zoom mock trial my freshman year where the accent and smiling on cross was enough to win you awards and win you points is sitting in a room. And we talked about sort of the small room reverence looking at you. One of my, my first rounds of my first tournament was against Benedemski and Tufse in a massive room, like a massive, almost lecture hall sized room where I never practiced physicality as a witness. It was my first in-person tournament and I was small. I was quiet. I was small and I didn't give a good director, a good cross that wasn't using the space. Um, and I, so I, as far as this witness goes, I mean, if you think uh, Italian, New Yorker, I mean, you got the gabagool hands, you got the this, you got that. It's very intentional um, to the extent where in my direct, I write in brackets, hella hands. That's the only stage direction I ever give myself is wave your arms around, get big, get energetic. Um, Cause we're about to see, we're about to hit sort of the content heavy portion of the direct where it's, where were you? What did you see? How far were they? What they look like? Coming to that sort of part in the direct with a lot of physicality, a lot of jokes, a lot of character kind of gives them enough to satisfy the judges as I go through sort of the, the drier part of the direct. I mean, I call it after my said, hey, hey, boss, come in. Let me see invitation right, right here. No sooner do I say that. They just run right past me, right through me, like I'm cast with a ghost. I mean, I don't look like them, but they don't need to run right through me like that. Mr. Cosmos, I want to talk to you about Berkeley de Laporta who's involved in this rock. Sure, sure. Well, sir, when you saw those two people, did you see Miss de Laporta with them? No. Did you ever see Miss de Laporta speak to either of those two people? No, I never saw that. Objection, Your Honor. For speech to Laporta over in my lady bird. Sure. Your Honor, this testimony is substantially more misleading than it is probative. Now, today we're in court. Um, accusing Ms. Delaporta of conspiracy grand theft. Ms. Delaporta doesn't actually physically have to be there stealing those paintings for us to prove our, our charge, Your Honor. This line of questioning goes directly to mislead the jury and to conflict our burden in today's case. Your Honor, it goes to if a witness, an eyewitness, saw the person they're accusing of this crime interacting with those robbers, that, that's a matter of weight for cross-examination opposing counsel sees fit. I tend to agree. Your objections will take in, but I think that's a weight and admissibility issue. Yeah. Uh, clearly um, an admissible question, right? Uh, yeah. Although a pretty sort of creative objection, and maybe you get a presiding judge to bite on that. Um, but I think the thing that stands out to me is that our, our attorney in the video here is a sophomore. Yes. Yep. Pretty pretty good poise for a, a fall fall tournament sophomore to sort of not blink and respond in a way that one of the things that I see from really good competitors who are trying to get great is they're correct on objection responses, but they're not always succinct, mm -hmm. concise. And the thing I liked so much about 
that back and forth there is both competitors really, but especially um, especially the responding attorney are concise and to the point. Um, speak, the an eyewitness uh, testifying as to whether the accused was with the robbers speaks to whether he was involved. Their concerns go to wait. They can probe it on cross. The end. Really succinct. Really clear and concise. Um, is, did this guy do high school mock? Um, I think he did, but I think that that was because he was on our A team starting out as a freshman last year. I think that was one of his strongest suits and why he ended up being on our A team is that regardless of whether you have the technical knowledge, obviously college mock trial going from high school, it, it, it requires a lot more technical stuff to grasp, but more so he was just very calm under pressure and very much knew that I may not know what I'm saying right now or don't know exactly how to respond, but I know that I can just get off an answer and that might be confident enough to, to like kind of fake it till you make it that sort of thing. And then the technical stuff can be added later. Um, so I think he now really pairs it well together, but even, I mean, watching that and knowing Gabe, I, I can tell that he was a little bit thrown off and kind of didn't know what he was saying, but he like strung enough things together confidently to get it through. Um, so yeah, I think that was just, that's just one of his strong suits. Yeah, and I will stop calling him that guy. I'm going to start calling him Gabe. He's earned it. Actual <laughs> response. He, I'll not call him by his name. Gabe. Well, Sometimes uh, I don't call him by his name. I say, "Hey, guy, come over here and carry the evidence box." I still haze him a little bit. Um, but 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 all jokes aside, I mean, Gabe has done this multiple times. That's why we work so well together. He protects me, right? I, we write our directs knowing that hey, it's objectionable, but Gabe's got my back. Um, and so for what it's worth, he does go up to bat for his witness. And I think that's something as a program, we do a lot of one from practice, two from necessity, three from just genuinely being a friends who are very inv invested in each other's success. Where like, I will never see Gabe miss an objection because he's scared to get overruled. If I'm getting attacked, he's going to be out there for me. That's across our program. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, but, but Mr. Rotini, I, I will not call him Gabe for the rest of the podcast, Mr. Rotini up there, you know, he'll go up to bat for me and he'll defend his witness. And I think that goes a long way between our rapport. Well, that was really nice. Yeah, I, I, I got to be nice every now and then. Otherwise he'll start to hate me and then it's all over and I can't. Is his name that. actually Rotini? It's Rosella, but we hit two teams back to back at, I believe it was actually Q bait last year that called them oh. Mr. Rotini, Mr. Fusilli, Mr. Linguini, like Mr. Borelli all over the place. And so now it's a running joke. We just say a pasta and call it good. I literally can't even, I don't even remember what his actual name is that you said. Ten <laughs> ago. I just can't stop thinking about R Rotini. Maybe if you say it enough, it'll catch on around the community and he won't have a real name. I mean, maybe I'll get lucky like that. Gabe Rotini. Oh, there we good. go. Yes, sir. Mr. Cosmos, did you ever see those people interact with Ms. Salem? He just looks like a Gabe Rotini, doesn't he? That's right. Hey, <laughs> It's a name. It's a name well earned for what it's worth. It's a name well earned. A little bit. No, not that many. Sir, in your entire time planning this event with Miss De La Porta, did you ever see her interact with either? All right, let me give, can I give one minor critique of this direct? Please. So, um, I think you, I think Rotini and, and you, I think you guys look at the jury a little too much. And, one of the things that you said a few minutes ago that I super appreciate, and I think is the right way to think about this is you're not always going to appeal to everyone, but you need to try to appeal to the most people, right? Obviously. And I think some judges, particularly real trial lawyers, are going to be polarized by lawyers and witnesses who are constantly looking at them mm -hmm. because they know that's not the way real witnesses behave and it's not the way real trial lawyers behave. So are you cognizant of that? Are you doing it on purpose? Is it sort of not on purpose? Part of it is probably because you're in a small room, I think has a little bit to do with it. Um, how much of it is it deliberate? As much as I like to say, it's all scripted. It's not. Uh, part of it is naturally like I'm begging for attention. That's my job. Look at me, pay attention to me. So I think some of it is just naturally I want to invite them back in. And if I remember in this particular round, big note takers, Right, which as you alluded to earlier can be difficult when you're trying to give a performance especially a funny one like uh, i'm making a joke why aren't you laughing yet 
so that that's one aspect of it that I think is well taken. It's it's a balancing act, and frankly, it's not usually intentional. I, I try at this point to feel out the room and sort of get a gauge on what the judges are looking for, uh, but I'm not always going to be correct. You know, like at the end of the day, you the best baseball players only bat 300. You know, and hopefully I'm a little bit better than 30 percent, right? But it's not intentional, and sometimes it's just not going to be where it needs to be, and that's just the reality. Yeah, it's definitely. I can tell it's like it's not scripted to that point that we know that we always look at the judges at a particular time, especially just at this particular tournament. We had a quick turnaround between getting our team together, like restacking and then going to this tournament. Um, but I think we also knew going into this round that our judges were AMTA competitors, that they weren't trial lawyers. So that also does play a role. Um, and how we respond and react. It's like, if I can recognize my judge and be like, you are an empty competitor, not trial, like that definitely affects how you're going to perform in front of them. Yeah, you sort of read my mind with that. Like the one sort of exception to that, I don't want to say exception because, you know, one of the things I like to say to my teams is I'd, I'd rather be correct, even if even if our, you know, the judges aren't going to understand that role, but I'd rather be correct, right? And I'd rather be correct and look at the jury the appropriate amount of times. That said, I definitely think there are AMTA alums who can be on your panel who might say, well, you're supposed to look at the, you know, look at the the jury on every answer as a witness, especially. And I would have liked more eye contact. Like you can sort of hear that comment, right? So it's one of those things where, uh, like you said at the beginning, Stephen, you got to just sort of appeal to as many people as, as possible. And I would, that's hard. Always. But, uh, you know, you, you take your swings where you can. You won't always hit. But if you do it enough times, eventually you'll get it right. So it's just hit or miss. For those who be. No, not in the week. Some months before, I never saw it. Thank you, sir. No further questions, you're on. Sure. Great. Cross the nation. That's really, really great. Um, I would imagine this direct this character scored pretty well this fall um it must be to the depth of your program right now that i don't know that did you win any witness awards this fall steven yeah i i won an award for that witness at cubate i don't honestly i don't remember the ranks but i i didn't do i did emotional witnessing or party rep witnessing the fall i was playing both defendants um and i did i did a little bit of uh, character witnessing as well um, but at, up to this point, this is the first time I'd run all characters in a tournament. And I was believe I was pretty close on both sides. But running that character in, in sort of that direct as we had written and scoring that well was was good to see. Um, sort of on the route of giving critical feedback and something I, I want to point out. A lot of the answers I give don't necessarily respond to the question. Not to the extent that it's unresponsive, but a lot of the feedback you get in round is you asked X, you gave the answer Y, and you also gave extra information Z, A, 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 B. Etc. cetera. Um, from my particular witnessing, we've seen over the years, the less I talk time-wise, the better. After about six minutes, the big poly, the good fellas bit sort of wears off. And so from just a, a creative decision, even if I'm not being the most responsive witness, I'm not giving the most natural answers, keeping me at truncated at like six minutes on the top end massively improves my likability because after a certain amount of time, the joke is up, the jig is up, and then it, it all goes downhill from there. I also just, you know, for what it's worth, I wonder, because the character is so credible, right? The accent, mm -hmm. the persona is so credible. I wonder if it would almost benefit from less jokes, you know? If you 100%. had 30% less jokes and you were just up there playing it straight with the accent and the hands and everything, but you weren't like, you know, I'm the Lady Liberty or whatever that the, the joke was. Um, if you did that less, I wonder if it would almost be like just refreshing that you're a yeah. character. It's not like in your face constantly, you know, I wish you could see the first draft of my directs because there's probably two or three jokes per question, a, B and C options, and they always get axed. Um, but as, as again, as I alluded to earlier, it's reps in the gym. It's also such a privilege to compete in high level rounds against good teams and good judging pools will punish you for being a comic and not a, and not a witness. Um, I think by the time we hit regionals and orcs, the jokes are probably about 30 to 40% of where they are when they're first written, right? It's sort of, again, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. The Lady Liberty joke, the Baklava, Balakava, Ski Mask joke were, were not scripted. Those were in the moment. 
So we review the footage, we look at the scores, we look at the comments, and we say that that was crickets or that got booming laughter, and we make decisions from there. Um, but you can't be afraid to fail when you're making those sort of in the moment judgment calls, because as Awesome said, rather you make a decision and be wrong than not make one at all. Yeah, and you know, I'm we're having sort of a, a conversation that maybe sounds like I'm being critical of of the character, but I actually think of all the people that we've had on the show, this is sort of the highest level character witness conversation that we've had on the show. I think mostly because you're doing almost everything from my perspective correctly. Um, and so you're looking for things on the margins where you can say, how can I be the best witness in a, in a national championship? Right. How can I be like, when I watched that, uh, Harvard final round that I, from 2015, I think Neil's the best witness in that round, um, because of all the reasons that I think you're a good witness, he's credible. He's not like in your face. It's easy to listen to, to the point that you made earlier. It doesn't feel like I'm please let this end. Like I need to stop listening to these jokes. Like it doesn't feel that way. Um, and so I think it's really great. Uh, I, I think you're going to clean up the spring if I had to guess, especially considering that you're doubling, double witnessing. I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll move on to Lanaya, the real star of the show, but critiques make or break everything. I mean, the amount of editing I get from my, my teammates and my coaches is just off the charts. And so like to emphasize again, this is a team effort. And if I did what I, if I performed what I wrote in my first rendition of the direct, it would be straight ones. It would be a, a dumpster fire. So critiques and editing is the biggest part of our program that I think really aids us in going from this level to that level. So it, critiques are always appreciated. From your perspective as someone who I think is doing this at a really high level, who is the best character witness you've ever seen? And I'm going to ban you from picking someone from Maryland. Mr. Rajon, not Rajon. I mean, phenomenal. I mean, I was, like I said, when I go on the defense, I'm always like, where's the bar? How can I get over it? And we saw him at Cubay round four last year playing Aubrey Roy, pilot instructor, Bond, James Bond, Crimson Suit. I mean, it was chef's kiss. And um, in the hallway, we're riffing impressions. In the break, we're riffing different accents. He's the best character witness I've ever seen, best witness I've ever seen. And so that's the bar. I see him at sort of his opening ceremonies and I'm looking at him like that's the competition. Um, there's no complacency there. And I've seen him among others, but him in particular playing similar styles of witnessing, um, using I think the same sort of tools to to score well is really inspiring because I, I want to beat him, but it's really hard. <laughs> Um, we are about to move on to the second uh, half of our episode. And Lanaya, we're going to watch your cross from Charm City against UVA. Um, so are we going backwards in time or forwards in time? We are going far backwards in time to the first uh, weekend of tournaments that we had this fall invitational. So we just got our unstacked teams together. I think my team got they're like cast about two weeks before this tournament came in, maybe two and a half. So that's about the timeline we're working on. Um, but yeah, very first tournament weekend for our program. So same case, which witness are you cross-examining in, in this trial? I am cross-examining the defendant, Berkeley De La Porta. Um, and so we're going against UVA A, or I guess, you know, what their A team was for whatever that tournament was, but they had both their A and B tournaments. So just a little background is this is the third round and in the second round, I had, we went against UVA B on the exact same side. Um, so I don't I don't know to the extent that they would discuss our theory having one of their other teams see it. I think maybe they wouldn't because it would maybe give too much benefit to the team their team now. But I mean I can't. But that's just speculation into what they're. Well, there's no, and, and there's there's nothing against the rules, right? At, in this setting of communicating, yeah. What you're wondering is, you know, would they purposely not tell their teammates to sort of simulate what a real trial would be like in regional season? Yeah, to whether they would get more practice. I don't know. So, but that's just a little bit of context as to how, like, how I'm going into this. I'm not sure what they will respond to or what they know of my cross, um, but I kind of just go for it anyway. And <laughs> I don't think it really affected uh, me. Good morning. Good morning. 
is what I am Davidson. I just have a few questions to ask you, Mr. Davidson. Sure. I first want to start off by talking about the security measures at the Miller Tower auction. Well, sir, like you said, you were one of the co-chairs of that auction, correct? Yes, I was. You're actually the one who wanted this auction held at Miller Tower. That's true. You strongly pushed for this auction to be held at Miller Tower. I did. Sir, your company built the vault at the top of Miller Tower, right? Yes. And you know that Miller Tower has a helipad on top of the tower. I know this. Sir, you know that that helipad is a major weakness in the vault security, correct? Yes. Sir, when you strongly pushed for this auction to be held at Miller Tower, you knew that helipad was a weakness, right? That is correct. You thought it was one of the most um, significant faults. I'll pause right here. So I think at this like opening portion, I'm using a lot of hand motions. I think I just do it throughout the whole thing and I, I go all the way up for the 40th floor. That isn't scripted in a way only because coming into this tournament again we had like two weeks turnaround just to prep all of our material most of this cross is i had it written down but most of this cross is just me trying to remember the like bullet points of what i'm trying to hit so this is just like i'm trying to fulfill my natural instinct of performance so at times i do it really like do some really big movements and at times I'm just kind of like waving my hands. I think I wave my hands a little bit too much throughout this whole thing. I should probably put them down at some point, but I will say I like that I did the whole movement, but it was just me trying to figure out things to do in the moment to appear bigger in the courtroom. I actually disagree slightly in the sense that I feel the opposite. Um, hmm. I think you're not taking it far enough. Um, hmm. So for example, when I, when I, um, so you do, you know, you push for the, whatever the phrase was. You know, the thing that I always tell my students is if you're going to do a gesture, it needs to be big, right? It can't be, so this is fine, right? But when you, if you want to do that gesture and make it pop, it needs to be pushed, right? You pushed really hard for it to be at the, whatever the question was. Right? Yeah, I agree with, with that. Um uh movement too that's why i think i i was waving my hands just generally too much because i did push and then i just kind of keep my hands here wave it around so it's right. like the gesture wasn't big there so i'm trying to do these gestures but i guess it, it, that's that's what it looks like when you don't plan them out and you're trying to do them in the moment they just come out like weird looking but <laughs> your, your instinct is correct it's just not you're not doing it hundred percent. Exactly. Right? It's not refined. That that that's what it is. It's not refined at that point. And the security. Yes. Sir, you had spoken to the director of security at Miller Tower, Miss Sands, correct? I had. She gave you the entire of entirety of the security <coughs> plan. True. You knew where all the cameras were. I did. You knew all the guard deployments. Yes. She even gave you a key card, correct? She did. Approaching opposing counsel with Exhibit 5. Permission to approach Mr. Dale Porto. <coughs> your Honor. Was that your first time, Linnea, going head-to-head -head against mock trial legend Ethan Marks? It was not. Um, the last time was um, at Cubate last year. I think that was the first time I had gone against him. Um, but yeah, we went against each other in, during um, Cubate, as well as Ansley Skipper, who is on that bench as well. And I think Karen Sons there too, who I went against my sophomore year at Orcs um, when she was playing an expert witness. I was cross-examining her. So definitely not the first time that I've encountered a lot of these people. Mr. Dale Porto, you recognize Exhibit 5 to be your key card, correct? I do. This is the key card that Ms. Sands gave to you. Yes. And it's fair and accurate? It is fair and accurate. State offers Exhibit 5 into evidence. All right, one more criticism of you here, Lenaya, or my first criticism, well, maybe my second, if you count the push one as a critique. Um, I, as a judge, don't like when 
I, I tend to I, I tend to sort of fall in the Liz and Azim category of technique is important to me. Um, and I'm a technique snob in a lot of ways. I guess a lot of judges are, are like that. And I don't I don't like that you're you're sort of showing the judges the exhibit before it's admitted. Mm. Right. If this were a real court, theoretically a judge could could yell at you and say, don't show. I mean, if Ethan would have objected, I would have sustained it if I were the judge and said, yeah, don't, don't, the, the exhibit should not be turned around. Is that the, were you cognizant of that or was that sort of just not deliberate? I was actually cognizant of that. In the moment, I realized I had it like facing away from me because I was really kind of just fiddling with it. Again, I, I'm feeling a little bit awkward in this cross because I, don't have it fully memorized or anything like that. I'm just, it, it's so brand new to, to be giving it that I was, I was cognizant that I had it facing the other way, but I didn't want to flip it around suddenly or do something. So I realized kind of in the moment and after the fact, I was like, I don't think anyone's going to say anything. So I like, but that's definitely something we've actually talked about in either scrimmages or things like that. It's like, don't, wave it around because Mr. Rotini has a habit of especially waving things around um, beforehand. We're like, we shouldn't wave that around, but sometimes, you know, it ends up happening. <laughs> the one thing that I notice with competitors who at the law school level go to Top Gun as two L's is they come back as a third year competitor and are just immensely better because for lots of reasons, but I think mostly because of confidence, you're sort of like, if I did that, I can definitely do this and do it well. And watching you do the first minute of this cross, even notwithstanding the two weeks of preparation and understanding this is early in the season, you just seem different than the video that I watched of you when you applied to combat last year and your plan uh, rounds. You seem more confident. You seem more in command of the room. Um, just everything about about you know when I watched that first minute, you just it just feels a notch better than it was last year. Do you feel that? Did you feel that way coming into the season? Definitely. I I had a lot like in the past years when I was competing. So for my sophomore and junior, I was an attorney, but not my freshman. But when I was competing as attorney in my sophomore and junior years, I had a lot of pre-round anxiety. Like I, it was something that I like really struggled with. When I got into round, it started to go away, but I was would be extremely anxious beforehand. Like no one talked to me. Like, let me get in like the zone. Let me try and like control my breathing. And then coming into this season, I think after doing the play-in and having 24 hours prep, having to compete and give a cross and do a direct and all of that, when I knew I didn't know anything, like I couldn't remember anything about the case or what my content was, gave me, it did give me the confidence to be like, I may not know what I'm going to say, but at this point, four years into doing this, I'm confident something is going to come out. And as long as I keep my composure, I can at least fake like I have the confidence or know what I'm going to say. So that's kind of a lot of what this is. It's me being like, my question's going to come out eventually. So I'll just pretend like that's exactly what I wanted to happen. Correct? I did. You know your key card was found at the scene of a crime, right? Yes. Sir, you remember the last time you had that key card, you left the Miller Tower with it, right? I just could. So on the security camera footage, so again, you sound great, but one thing that might enhance the performance, I think you probably probably agree with me, is like on that question. Sir, you remember the last time you had that key card, you left the Miller Tower. So le you left with the key card, right? Mm -hmm. you, your instinct is to say you left, right? You did, so you did do something to be physical. But, you know, maybe you left is better. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe even better yeah. is you, you, maybe you walk up the whatever that is uh stairs the, the aisle, right now and, that i was uh, i was afraid of because it was like really slanted and there were some <laughs> just some steps there i was like if i try and walk up that i might absolutely fall down <laughs> that fair was enough, fair enough I was a of. that's not purposeful movement falling down <laughs> your hips, but, yeah. Yeah. so yeah i completely agree with that so on the security camera footage those thieves they didn't just find your key card on the ground and pick it up and use it right I don't know what they did. I don't know these people. Sir, you watched that security camera footage. You didn't see them find it on the ground and pick it up, right? Really know. great, really that's great witness camera. control there, right? I don't want. I know that sounds like seems like a subtle thing to people that are watching, and it looks easy, but it only looks easy because you're making it look easy, right? So you say you uh, know the 
thieves didn't blah 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 and he sort of gives you an equivocal answer uh and you very calmly say well you know that because you watched the video and yep. that that is just superb witness control that again i think witness control is one of the things that separates a good cross examiner from an excellent cross examiner and you make it look really easy in the spot yeah I, that's like when i i think I call her Lanaya locked in Davidson because we give her depot witnesses all the time. Why? Because she won't take no for an answer. Like Lanaya is a brick wall of an attorney. Nothing's going to get past her. And I think that we talk about like what makes her great is that she will, she knows what the answer is and she's going to get it no matter what. And there's no wiggling out of it. And so watching her compete both in person, I've actually admittedly never watched this round intentionally to sort of react live, but um, Lanaya doesn't take no for an answer. And it's really great to see her control phenomenal witnesses and just prove that she's better. And so that's that's what I love to see when I do. Yeah. I don't know these people. Sir, you watched that security camera footage. You didn't see them find it on the ground and pick it up, right? I did not. From that security camera footage, they pulled out your key card. Isn't that correct? They did. Sir, now I want to talk to you about the police investigation. Because you told us on direct examination that the police obtained a search warrant for your house. They did. And they came in, they searched your entire house, right? So there's, you, you can't see it. I'll show it. I'll pull the, the video down a little bit here. And you can sort of see on the bottom of the screen that there's a camera there. Is that UVA's camera? I believe so, yeah. Did you guys have like dueling cameras in this round? I think we did. <laughs> we did. I, I think this is probably like a cell phone. Yeah, this is what, someone's cell phone that we have. And they have a real camera. And I think someone controlling it too. Um, yeah. Sounds uh, about right. <laughs> what? So this this is pretty good quality for a cell phone. It's just like someone's phone on a tripod. Yeah, it's just like held up on like some sort of phone tripod. Um, the witness in the brown suit on the left side of the screen—that's her phone. Um, I don't know, some some sort of you know iPhone. I guess that's pretty good quality. <laughs> well, Maya, don't drop a brand. We're not sponsored yet. We need the money. If we're gonna drop all a name right. brand, let's get sponsored first, okay? I mean, yeah, NCT like, tickets are expensive. All right, let's let's like, rein it in here. Shot with the iPhone 15. This is all, look at this screenshot yeah. on, a, on a billboard. <laughs> we talked about this yeah, before the podcast, Phil. No free ads. Come on. No, they haven't monetized me yet. So <laughs> someday. And I want to talk about a few items that you had mentioned they found. So while searching your house, you were present, right? Not for all of it. I was in the video. You were inside the house as they searched it. I was inside the house as they searched it. So you know that the police recovered a red key fob inside of your house. They did say they found it in my house. You saw that red key fob inside your house. I saw it after they showed it to me. I was not there when they found it. But you were inside your house when they pulled out that red key fob. Isn't that correct? Yes, I was. Great witness control again. That red key fob doesn't go to <clears throat> anything inside your house, right? No, it does not. Doesn't unlock anything inside that building, right? No, it does not. Well, sir, they also found a cell phone labeled Miller Tower inside your house, correct? They found it inside of my house. I don't know how it got there. Well, sir, it was inside a bag of other phones that are yours, right? It was inside of the bag. I saw Agent Wolf pull it out of the bag. But I did not put it into the bag. I have never seen that phone in my life. Okay, so let's just be clear. You have a bag of cell phones inside your house, right? Yes. You admit those cell phones in that bag are yours. The other phones are mine. And you watched Agent Burke reach into that bag and pull out the cell phone labeled Miller Tower, right? I saw Agent Burke do that, but I did not put that phone into the bag. Again, I have not seen that phone in my life. Sir, that's a yes. Agent Burke reached into that bag of phones that are yours and pulled out the cell phone labeled Miller Tower. That is correct. Impeccable control. All right. Uh, we, we can pause it right here because this was something that took me a while to learn, which is that when I was earlier in my, my career, I would like, you know, you have your written cross questions and when they give you something that you, you don't like, or they just add a lot of extra information, you know, like the, the amateur, like, or, or new competitor just does like the directing you back to my question or is that a yes and kind of like leaves it at that but I started to realize only after watching my own footage back that when the witness muddles an answer makes something really confusing 
whether regardless of whether you get your yes or no, like you have to break it down so simply because even if they give you your yes or no and you're like, I'm allowed to move on to my next question, I guess, the judge will have completely misunderstood or not understand what just happened. They'll be like, you said one thing, the witness said something, and I have no idea what came out of that exchange. So I just found it really important that when when I hear witness answer, I'm like, I'm confused about what you're saying right now. I always like take, I'm like, let's break this down and get it as simple as possible. Because if I'm confused as the crossing attorney, the judges are absolutely going to be confused about it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and the you're, you're right about when you say that there's sort of the basic control that newer competitors learn. But I think one of the things that you see is even better competitors who learn how to witness control. One of the important things that you do so well in this cross is you vary your control, right? So we're, we're not hearing the same thing over and over, even if it's effective in, you know, as, as a, in a vacuum, right? We're hearing different, you, sometimes you say, and by the way, you do use, is that a yes, right? Exactly. There, yeah. there are times where is that a yes is appropriate. And that was, that was the time, right? Um, so I think this is a really good example of engaging with the witness when appropriate, right? Um, using your sort of next question as a control at times. That's the example of, well, you watched the video, you saw them, blah, 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 right? And then sort of the thing that you just said, which is witness gives, yes, but blah, 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 blah. And rather than saying, redirecting you back to my question, you sort of engage with, with with what they're saying, you know, okay, let's make sure we understand what you're saying and what you're not saying. You admit this, 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 and this, and this, at least, right? So it's a really, really good job of witness control. The other thing is I think really good competitors, sometimes there's a tendency to want to go down a rabbit hole and engage too much. Mm -hmm. This cross does a nice job of not doing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think that that also lends itself to the earliness of of how of this tournament where it's like I couldn't try and fight this witness on all of that information if I wanted to like there and I tend to not to, to try not to do that I write my crosses very much fact specific like I have a line in the affidavit that I'm going to go back to if for some reason the witness gives me the answer that I don't like like always ready for the impeachment essentially so I know when like what answer should be coming out and if I'm not getting it like then that's a me to control the witness. They, they were looking for God knows what, right? That's what he said? Yes. Sir. And that's a line from his direct examination. Um, he said they got a search warrant and they were looking for God knows what. And I was like, well, well, you have the stolen paintings in, in your basement. So I was like, let me pull that back because God knows what. I mean, we all know what they're looking for. Right. Um, so. oh, it also just sounded good. You know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure that the substance matters that much in that question. Just like, you sound good saying God knows what. <laughs> Inside of your house, right? I do. Okay. Inside that hidden room were three stolen paintings. The paintings were stolen in the auction, but I did not steal do UVA have multiple witnesses sitting back there that have bow ties? Or, I wouldn't be surprised. I, Are they both know, wearing bow ties? It's either the the one on the one the the one on the right is definitely wearing a bow tie. The one on the left is either wearing a bow tie or like a bolo tie. <laughs> Use their they're, both equal, they're both equally just a decision. A creative decision. <laughs> it would almost be <laughs> yeah. more outrageous if it was a bolo and a bow tie. That would it mean that all of their witnesses have the every time. kind of tie there is. All the three witnesses would be, they'd be representing each each form of tie. Maybe we'll be able to tell a little bit better if he moves a little bit here. Maybe. Yes. Sir, you were in possession of three stolen paintings. I was. And at the time that you were in possession of those three stolen paintings, you knew they were stolen. I was aware what had happened to them. And sir, you claimed on direct examination that you bought these paintings for safekeeping. Is that right? To prevent the risk of the art being damaged by the robbers. Yes. Sir, when you bought these paintings that you claim you found on auction, you don't have a, a receipt from that website, do you? No. You don't have any records of a transaction ever occurring? 
No. No records that those paintings were delivered from somebody else into your own house? No. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. The thing I like so much about this cross substantively was not, I mean, the control's amazing. Um, you perform it really well. Um, it's really simple. I don't know the case at, at all. As I said at the beginning of the, of the show, I've never read the case. I only know what people say about it on the internet. And um, so, but I feel like I know the case, what the case is about now after watching that cross. Um, it's really simple. It's easy to follow to the point that you made a second ago, which is like fact, 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 fact. Um, you don't engage in sort of the unnecessary details. It's a really, really good, good cross, which I'm sure you're going to tell me it was actually bad because it was only two weeks into the season, but I liked it. No, <laughs> no, I, I did purposely, at least for this witness, I, I, I started writing the cross and by the end of it, I was like, this is kind of a short cross, but I mean, what else is there more to say? You can hear at the very kind of towards the end that I go like, you have these paintings, you're in possession of these. I'm, I'm really just asking questions that are the elements of the crime we're charging. I'm, I'm just asking the elements to him. And because of the way the affidavit was worded, like you have to say yes to it. Um, and because of their theory, he was saying yes to them. So I didn't find, I mean, if the witness is going to admit to the crime in cross-examination, like what more is there to do? I'm not going to try and fight them on every single other thing. Like I'll keep it simple and sit back down. Like, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, you know, when I, you and I had only spoken briefly um, leading up to the plan and not, I think at all sense. Um, and Stephen, this is the first time we're meeting. And it is really obvious sitting on Zoom with you guys for an hour and a half why you both have done so well. I mean, you're both super talented, but I think I think you guys think about this the, the correct way, at least in my opinion. Um, I, I appreciate the level of detail and the attention to like technique and simplicity. Um, and maybe that's a lot to do with sort of the institutional knowledge of the program that's been at the top of AMTA for a long time. Maybe it's something to do with a lot of the, with the coaching staff that you guys have, which having sat here for an hour and a half, hour and a half with you guys, I'd like to be a part of, uh, if you'll <laughs> let me. Um, I'd, I'd like to ring chase uh, with you guys. Um, you can put me on anything. I'll, I'll work on the, you know, the, the, the D middle cross or whatever you need me to do. With the, with, the, with the six person team, we need a timekeeper. So, I mean, okay. there, there is a vacancy. It's up to you, but I'm there's in. a vacancy. All right, there we I'm go. Up. I'll pay. I'll even pay for my own uh, flights and hotels. That's um, music to my ears. Um, <laughs> but I just, I just think your guys' philosophy is just correct, and it's borne out by those two performances, the way that the cross is done, and the way that that character is portrayed. I just, this is the way that mock trial should be done at a high level, and um, I hope that you guys get the results that prove me right this spring. What, I hope so too. <laughs> what's the goal? Yeah. Obviously, to win the national championship, but what's the goal? Me personally, I mean, to quote Michael Jordan from whatever the name of the documentary was, I took it personal. I think that a lot of the previous years, UMB has a chip on their shoulder. When I mentioned we haven't won a national championship since like 2008, right? If I, if my modern trial knowledge is correct, um, I think a lot of the times you've gone into rooms underestimated and we play with a chip on our shoulder and we treat every single round like it's the high, high at orcs or the final round at NCT. And so with that being said, I think it's led to our success in the fall. I hope it continues to lead to our success in the spring, but we've worked really, really hard as a program in the last three, now four years since Lanai and I have been here to be a team people are afraid to hit, to be a team the top teams want to challenge, to be a team that people look out for. And so I think we take none of that for granted. It's all been a collective effort of hard work from coaches to returning competitors to new competitors. But I can promise my teammates, I can promise the rest of the Ants community, we're going to be the hungriest team in every single room we walk into. And I think that's our mentality and the results you want will come from that as long as we keep that up. Yeah, I think especially for Steven and I in particular and, and some of our other teammates who are, have also been, you know, are now on their fourth year. And Steven and I did go to nationals and we're on the nationals team our first year, but we had no idea what was going on at that time. We didn't know what we were in for, or like just the level of 
what was going on around us. We were just sitting on Zoom doing what we were told and then like, oh, we're winning, cool. And then after we started learning in the next two years and we didn't repeat those results and we were like, we really wanted to get back to where we were because now we have all of this knowledge and we've competed for so long and to be so close to like getting back there both years and not repeating it it's you know it makes you want it even more so I think that's kind of what where we're going into it we have a very um senior heavy team this year especially four of our competitors are are, are seniors for our a team um so four out of six so you know it's our last chance really um for us so we really want it um you guys know I end the episode uh, usually by asking competitors this question. Uh, so I have a series of questions actually for you. Um, question number one, who is the best competitor of all time? The rules are you may not choose each other um, and you may not say the same person. Well, now you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The best competitor of all time. I think, I think the last time you asked me this, I think you asked me this last last time I was on here was I said Sydney. I don't think I did ask. And did I ask you? I'm not sure. I I remember talking about Sydney Gaskins, but that could have been completely unrelated. Who knows? I probably brought her up myself. But <laughs> um, I I'll ch- okay. I'll change it up this time, and I'll go for Ben Wallace, senior, <laughs> not the real senior, but um, yeah. I when I was growing. So just to clarify, not the one from South Carolina who I competed against. Um, you, you hate you hate him, right? Yeah, I hate that guy. No, he's actually been really nice. So, um, um, but yeah, I think when, when I watched his round footage as I was like growing as a competitor, I started watching a lot of rounds. And what I noticed a lot from him was just a level of authenticity that I hadn't been bringing. I'd been trying to replicate other people's styles for so long. And I watched this stuff and I was like, it wasn't the flashy, like crazy stuff, but it was so authentic. And I was like, wow, I really want to try and bring that level of authenticity. And it kind of just inspired me to be more of myself and less of trying to be someone else, which I think is really necessary if you want to be, if you, if you want to be like, good at this activity I guess because you could only pretend to be someone else for so long until you have to bring yourself to the role um so I think that's where I'll where I'll go for now until you ask me next time he's he's my vote um I think Ben's the best uh I super respect his style um I respect how much of a tactician he is um and um he's really good on the rules which is something that is important to me. Um, yep. And he won law school national, the law school national championship and then Top Gun. So uh, one of only two people to be in the final twice uh, at Top Gun. And so I, I, I agree with you there. I think it's him. Um, Steven, that's enough stalling. <laughs> Your answer? Uh, Dan Stern, but bear with me. Bear with me. It's not because he won X, Y, and Z. It's not for the same reasons the mock trial history loves probably put him down in the books of grades for. Um, the, I remember I watched him the first time and he looked, he was having a really good time. If I look back at my four years, I've never chased technical perfection. I've never chased uh, an award. I've never chased to be someone else like when I said authenticity, I'm at my best when I'm having fun. I can think of rounds where I didn't have fun and it cost me a lot. I can think of rounds where we didn't have fun as a program and it cost us a lot. Watching him and his shenanigans and shenanigans that were technical perfection, shenanigans that were the poster child of a good attorney, he showed a level of having fun with it that I think has driven me in the last four years and maybe not the greatest, but if I were to think about the most important person I ever watched, watched when he was just there to give a performance and give a a, a Tom Cruise from A Few Good Men cross-examination, just really lean into the bit that we're playing because whether we like it or not, we're not attorneys yet. We're not law students yet. We're not billionaires. We're just kids. We know we're undergraduates pretending to be someone that we're not. And he did that to a T. And I think that to me is the greatest performance you can put on is one where you convince someone you're something you're not. Yeah, to bring this all full circle, when I was a 
junior, we got invited to QB for the first time at Delaware. We won. And we saw Yale in one of the high, high rounds on day two. I think it was Yale B or unstacked Yale or something. And he was a sophomore. And I just remember being like, who is that guy? Uh, he's awesome. I, no one knew who he was at that point. Um, but I always remembered him. And I was not surprised at all to see the crazy success he had after that. Um, and so very different competitor than Ben, but another good answer. Um, last question. Who is going to win trial by combat 2024? And you can't say Lanaya or anyone. Why not? Because <laughs> those are the rules. Sorry. Lanaya, you can go first again. <laughs> okay. Um, I think my pick would be Sam Farnsworth, Chicago. That's right. Um, he's, he's still around. Yeah, I it, it it's it's only sh- it shocks me when I see people who are so good for so long uh, because we actually hit him our sophomore year because we went to online Chicago Fire. Um, it was a slightly traumatizing round how good <laughs> they were, and we hit their I think it's their B team at QB, um, and their B team was phenomenal. Um, we we split with them; they had the same record same cs it went down to ocs um for us to even win cubate that's how close and the teams were so i would expect that their a team will be even stronger and i know sam has been around um is very good so that's my pick yeah love farnsworth he was dangerously close last year to making the playoffs at combat um and he's really good he's really really good i was not surprised at all to see him in the mix on uh, on on day day two of combat i'm going into round four so good pick steven we stalled shame on you for taking my answer because to lanaya's point i remember <laughs> that you chicago round my junior year we were in the high high i was captaining for the first time i was like my god we're gonna do it i was uh bucked off of two rain energy drinks i was exhausted i was ready to win and i watched that man eviscerate our expert i watched that man almost single-handedly destroy us and go from high, high in round three to like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, 12th place. Um, and again, like Lanaya hitting you Chicago at Cubate. I, I always keep an eye on, like I said, for that final round at NCT and like watching programs, watching people who can do it. 